Four years ago, a white man shot and killed 51 people at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. He was eventually sentenced to life in prison after pleading guilty to 51 counts of murder, 40 counts of attempted murder and one charge of terrorism. Prosecutors say he was looking to kill as many people as possible. In his anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim and white supremacist manifesto, the gunman called then-President Donald Trump a symbol of renewed white identity. But when asked if he thought white supremacist terrorism was a problem, here's what President Trump said at the time. You see today white nationalism as a rising threat around the world. I don't really. I think it's a uh, small group of people that have very, very serious problems. Not a rising threat, the then president said. He's far from the only Republican to downplay the threat from white supremacist violence, from far right, quote unquote, domestic terrorism. Just listen to former GOP Congressman Sean Duffy in 2017 after a different mosque massacre saying the quiet part out loud. Why isn't the president talking about the white terrorist who mowed down six Muslims who were praying at their mosque? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but I would just tell you, there's a, there is a difference. Um, again, d death and, and, and murder on both sides is wrong. But if you want to take the dozens of scenarios where mm -hmm. ISIS-inspired attacks have taken innocence, and you give me one example of what's happened, I think that was in Canada, yeah. um, I'm going to condemn them all. Uh, but again, you don't have a group like ISIS or Al-Qaeda that's inspiring people around the world to take up arms and kill innocents. That was a one-off. A one-off. And there's a difference, apparently, between white terrorists who kill brown people and brown terrorists who kill white people. Congratulations, Sean. You just became a walking family guy meme. But it's not just politicians. Tucker Carlson, the most watched primetime conservative cable host, went on TV in front of millions of viewers months after Christchurch and called white supremacy a complete hoax. But the whole thing is a lie. If you were to assemble a list, a hierarchy of concerns, of problems this country faces, where would white supremacy be on the list? Right up there with Russia, probably. It's actually not a real problem in America. The combined membership of every white supremacist organization in this country would be able to fit inside a college football stadium? I mean, seriously. This is a country where the average person is getting poorer, where the suicide rate is spiking. White supremacy, that's the problem. This is a hoax. Now, why might Republicans want to pretend that white supremacist far-right terrorism doesn't exist? Well, then they might not have to confront their own roles in stoking the white racial resentment that's behind a lot of it. Unfortunately, as right-wingers love to say, facts don't care about your feelings. And the bottom line is, we now live in an age where terrorism in the US isn't dominated by so-called Islamist extremists, who are largely not white, but by far-right domestic extremists who are predominantly white. And don't take my word for it. The Anti-Defamation League just published a new report on extremism in the United States in 2022. And they found that all of the 2022 extremist-related murders in the US were committed by right-wing extremists. Yes, all of them. And over 80% were committed by white supremacists. As the report notes, the past two years have seen as many mass killings as the period between 2001 and 2010. The authors say it's not an exaggeration to say that we live in an age of extremist mass killings. And the ADL isn't the only organization sounding the alarm. FBI Director Christopher Wray has warned for years that white supremacy is a top domestic terror threat, including in front of a Senate panel in 2021. Racially motivated violent extremism, specifically of the sort that advocates for the superiority of the white race, uh, is a persistent, evolving threat. The same group of people we're talking about have been responsible for uh, the most lethal attacks uh, over the last, uh, say, decade. For the past 20 years, the word terrorist meant a brown dude with a big beard with a name like mine. But now intelligence agencies and security services have belatedly recognized that there are other kinds of terrorism, no matter whether people like Carlson and Trump choose to acknowledge it. And unlike quote-unquote Islamist terrorism, often rooted overseas and led by fringe and obscure militant leaders, white supremacist terrorism and right-wing terrorism more broadly is homegrown, and they see the former president of the United States as their de facto leader. And that has violent consequences.
case in point, the Capitol riot. As Jacob Glick, who served as investigative counsel to the January 6th committee, notes in an article for Lawfare, the Capitol attack was the culmination of Trump's transformation from traditional head of state to a far-right fascistic cult leader whose promises to tear down multiracial democracy were understood by his supporters, not as posturing, but as long-awaited gospel. Glick continues, we cannot afford to look the other way, while Trump, newly restored to Facebook and Twitter, warns the country that his supporters are locked and loaded to physically fight for him in 2024. That's what makes this moment so dangerous, and it's only going to get worse, especially if lawmakers on the right refuse to call out right-wing terrorists for what they are, or worse, grovel for forgiveness when they do. Remember on the one-year anniversary of the January 6th insurrection, Republican Senator Ted Cruz rightly called it a, quote, violent terrorist attack. And then he had to go on Tucker Carlson's Fox show to do this. You called this a terror attack when by no definition was it a terror attack. That's a lie. You told that lie on purpose, and I'm wondering why you did. Well, Tucker, thank you for having me on. When you aired your episode last night, I, I sent you a text shortly thereafter and said, listen, I'd like to go on because uh, the way I phrased things yesterday, it, it was sloppy and, and it was frankly dumb. I haven't seen Cruz backtrack and grovel like that since Trump suggested his wife was ugly and then Cruz still went to phone bank for Trump. On a more serious note, this is dangerous stuff. The denialism of the right when it comes to right-wing terrorism. The complicity of Republican leaders like Trump when it comes to events like 1-6. Look, Muslims like me, for 20 years after 9-11, after every subsequent Al-Qaeda or ISIS attack, were constantly told to condemn Muslim terrorism or otherwise be held collectively responsible, collectively guilty. Funny that those rules, they don't apply to the right today. Joining me now, Cynthia Miller Idris, director of the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab at American University and the author of Hate in the Homeland, the New Global Far Right. And Jamil Jaffa, who served in the senior national security roles in the Bush, in, excuse me, in the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration. He now runs the National Security Institute at George Mason University. Thank you both for coming back on the show. Cynthia, you have studied this stuff for years. You have been sounding the alarm. So were you surprised at all by this ADL report? that all of the 2022 extremist-related murders were committed by right-wing extremists. I wasn't surprised at all. I mean, I think it's one of the most predictable outcomes of an ongoing um, series of data points that we just keep hearing the same thing. On every data point we have available to us, the amount of propaganda circulating, the amount of plots being foiled by the FBI, uh, the the number of the lethality of these uh, attacks, and the, and the variety of different types of attacks kidnapping plots, but also targeted assassination attacks, infrastructure attacks, and then mass shooting attacks. These are all uh, uh, on the far right, uh, anti-government and white supremacist side have been increasing for years. And um, this is just one more data point in a long list of data points, in my view. So, Jamil, Cynthia mentions the history. In 2009, under President Obama, the Department of Homeland Security basically forced out an analyst who wrote a report warning about the rise of right-wing extremism after Republicans exploded with outrage. You worked in national security for the Bush administration at the height of the panic over al-Qaeda. Looking back now, do you think national security agencies as a whole across those two administrations missed the threat of right-wing extremism until it was essentially too late? Well, look, I think certainly it's been a huge issue, Mehdi. This issue of domestic extremism has been a problem for years, and it's gotten worse in recent years uh, with, the, with the situations we've seen in the country across the nation uh, with these type of attacks. And so I think there's no doubt uh, that our national security and in particular our law enforcement agencies need to focus in on the very real threat that domestic extremists pose uh, to our national security and to our domestic security in particular. Cynthia, talk to me about the double standard here. Republicans are so tough on Muslim terror against white people, but they can't even acknowledge white domestic terrorists. They demand people like me condemn Muslim terrorism, but they are deafeningly silent on the extremists and terrorists who emerge from within their own ranks, their own movement, their own base often. Yeah, I would say not only is there this double standard that you're referencing, but there's also a direct through line from the kind of war, the global war on terror, terror and, the, and the xenophobia and the Islamophobia that that engendered and some of the hatred that emerged over the last decade. Um, so, you know, we did see a spike in, in hate groups, the, the record-breaking number of hate groups after President Obama was elected. And so we, we really do see this uh, not only related to post-9-11 backlash, but I think you can't ignore the 
the, um, the, the war on terror, the xenophobia, the fear of foreigners, the fear of, of Muslims as driving some of what later uh, came out in a much broader range of anti-LGBTQ, of anti-Semitic, uh, of, anti of, of anti-Muslim, uh, and of uh, attacks on Black Americans and Latino communities and others. Um, so we've had you know, a wide variety of targets, all with the same kind of base ideology that now is belatedly, very belatedly acknowledged as the, the greatest threat facing the nation and its homeland security. It's such a good point. Uh, Donald Trump, who these white supremacist groups often see as a kind of leader or symbol, rode to power uh, with Islamophobia, with his Muslim ban. Uh, Jamil, what do you make of the double standards when it comes to the treatment of quote unquote Islamist terrorism versus domestic terrorism? And not just the double standards. You have conservatives exploding in faux outrage, in my view, whenever the terrorism label is directed anywhere near anything to do with them. I mentioned Daryl Johnson, the DHS analyst. He was fired because conservatives said he's calling all conservatives terrorists, which he wasn't. Merrick Garland is often falsely accused of labeling conservative parents at school board meetings as terrorists, when, of course, that's not what the DOJ said. They were referring to threats against the lives of school board members. So you can't even have an open conversation about this because there's so much denialism on the right. Well, Benny, I think that this is a larger problem of um, the inability of us to have sensible conversations about our politics, about the issues that divide us, and about our disagreements. But to go to your specific point about whether there's a double standard, I think certainly it's critical that conservatives and liberals alike call out domestic extremism for what it is when it's used in a terroristic way, which is to threaten a civilian population, to seek a political outcome, right? These use of violence and the like, that is terrorism, whether it's fomented from overseas or from within the United States. And so what happened on January 6th, I think there can be no question, was a terrorist attack, period, full stop. The Republican leadership that called out, like Kevin McCarthy on that day, we're right when they did it, and we're wrong to wrong to pull it back. And so now, what I do, have, I do have some with is this categorization of all extremists that we're seeing domestically as being right wing. I don't think that's an accurate description, right? I think that the that sort of the bucket of right wing extremism is very broad when used in, as the way the ADL does it. I'm not sure right wing is the right way to categorize it, right? Certainly, these people are not conservatives or Republicans by any stretch of the imagination. They're simply extremists who don't agree with basic American Hold on. values. Hold on, let me just jump in there. January 6th, despite Ted Cruz's groveling, was once described as terrorist attack by Ted Cruz. The FBI have called it a terrorist That's attack. Right. The people who were there on January 6th were conservatives. They were Republicans. They voted for Donald Trump. They were there precisely because they were Republicans who were angry about the election result, weren't they, Jamil? It's not to say that Republicans or liberals or Democrats can't be terrorists. They certainly can. What I have a concern with is the categorization of all domestic extremists or the vast majority of them as right wing, which is largely what's happened today, right? It includes everything as like the incels and, you know, sort of a toxic masculine, uh, masculinity extremists, right? I don't know how those people are particularly right wing relative to anyone else. And so I, well, my issue with, with categorization, look, let's call terrorists terrorists, whether they're liberals or conservatives or any of the above, let's not cast as right wing or left wing. It's terrorism. It should be cast aside by both parties, including when they act. And yeah. if they're Republicans and they're and they're attacking the Capitol, should we call it by conservatives as well as liberals? As happened on that day, the people who walked it back never should have walked it back. Last word to you, Cynthia. Deal with Jamil's point about categorization. Is it too broad? Is it unfair to the right to call this right wing terror? I think the terms are terrible that we use. I think that everyone agrees that uh, that the term, what I use, I call it the best bad term available is far right terrorism because it's the term the Global Terrorism Index uses with the data, how the data is classified. It's not a very good term. But I do think we can look at what's happening within different categories. So I, I call it supremacist thinking. It's most commonly white supremacist, but it also includes male supremacists, Christian supremacists, Western supremacists. Uh, the Western chauvinism of the Proud Boys, all of those are fall into a category. Whether we call it far right or we call it just terrorism and extremism, I think we have to understand these things as linked, as about hierarchies of superiority and inferiority, and that feel a sense of threat that has to be met with violence. And uh, the, the terms, though, I think we can agree, are terrible. On that depressing note, we'll have to leave it there. Cynthia Miller-Idris and Jamil Jaffa, thank you so much for your analysis.